Hi, I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. So we have a lot to cover with the macro show. Uh, you know, obviously I was I was on hiatus, so now we have a lot of data that came out, which I think is important, especially given some of the most recent Chinese data. <clears throat> but we want to kick off segment one, looking at the World Bank. They increased growth in 2023, took it down in 24, but also there's a food problem, and we want to really hone in on the food problem as well because we think that really is going to impact a lot of these expectations. From growth, pers- from the growth perspective, especially when you consider inflation and the pain that that's going to cause at the emerging market level, then obviously we we know that the Fed paused uh, rate hikes, but are are they over? And we really want to look at you know, in our opinion, at least my opinion, the answer is no. We have at least one or two more. But getting to that five and a quarter, five and a half is really going to stop. And we want to talk about why we think we get another increase and why we do think we have that pause. And then we want to look at wages and how wages have fallen again. You know, some of the real wages have gotten slightly better, but we want to look at some of the different backdrops on how that stickiness inflation is going to become that uh, remain that overarching problem. Then we're going to look at Europe. You know, Germany entered a an official recession, which uh, likely means when you look at all of the data, Europe entered a, an official quote unquote recession. But we want to go through those different data points. And then China posted some really weak data and we want to look at, is it a blip? You know, obviously April was weak, May was weak again. And this is what we've been talking about is that you had that nice bounce following all of the reopenings and then you were going to get that continuous decline following that. But the decline, it doesn't mean that they're going to go go deep into a recession. It's just, you know, the, the good times or that that excess was now gone. And that's what we've been talking about. And some of the other data points that are showing some concern as we look at China. So now getting right into it, this is just looking at some of the data points from the World Bank. So the World Bank has revised its estimates for 2023 growth from 1.7% to 2.1%. But they brought 2024 growth down. They took it from 27 to 24 And China leads with a 5.6% growth estimate. Now, as we've been talking about, we believe that China is overestimating some of the, some of those those benefits. We think that there is a bigger issue in general when we look at underlying activity, which is something that we're going to talk about. But one of the things that we believe 2023 is overestimating, it's these uh, the rate cuts. And we'll talk about rate cuts in a minute. And, and there's just the real impact of consumer level inflation and things that people spend money on, i.e. food, especially when you look at the, uh, these key areas around the world. But the one thing, as we talked about with the IMF, we do agree that this is this is a continuous problem. This isn't just things are going to be a little soft in 23, and then we're going to get this strong bounce in 24. It's going to be a continuous issue that this is going to be a 23, 24, potentially 25 issue that is just going to be that death by a thousand cuts and that slower growth which again is going to to lead to a decade that is going to be a very difficult one. And one of the uh, one of the key issues as well is the fertility rate. And and I think this is something that we you know we've talked about multiple times, but we continue to highlight in terms of the problems that this is causing on those live births because remember anything above 2.3 children per uh, woman you're in a uh, you, the, there is a growth in the uh, population. 2.1 keeps things flat. 2.3 you're growing, and then anything below that, and you can see as obviously South Korea is shrinking. So the growth is happening in Africa, uh, in parts of Eastern Europe, while we have a continued slowdown around the world. And the problem with that is you have to then look at okay, well, what are we doing on? Uh, on immigration or is immigration going up, going down? Cause that's how you can supplement some of those losses. But the issue in, is, is on multiple levels because you need this for growth. You need this for industrial uh, expansion for the consumer, you know, who's buying what and how much. And that's why there's, there's always that continuous issue that comes from it. 
So when you look at it, uh, orange countries are below replacement level with South Korea far below. Countries in gray and blue are producing enough children for population to continue to grow. People can immigrate to other countries. So this map obviously isn't the final word, which is what we've been talking about. And that's why the U.S. is typically in a better position than others, because we do have a fairly open in um immigration policy, which allows us to take some of these uh, individuals that want some freedoms, want some uh, opportunities into this country. But it's not just it's not just the population side. It's this expectation as well. EM sent the emerging market central banks will start cutting towards the end of the year. But when you look at food, when you look at issues of around the world, it's difficult to see how that's going to be possible. And again, not to say that rates are going to continue to go up because we don't think rates are going to continue to go up in some of the emerging market regions, just because the Fed raising rates again is going to be enough to to slow down some of the uh, the pain in, in the emerging market level, just based on their uh, access to debt, their what interest rates they'd have to pay. But then the annualized change in imports in the six months to March, April relative to preceding six months. So the, there's a weak non-commodity import points to softer growth. And I think this is a key component as well that is showing those problems, which again, why emerging markets don't have to keep raising rates because the economy is already slowing. Now, because they've they issued so much liquidity during COVID is why that we believe they're going to be more, you know, let's call it quote unquote stuck in the current rate regime as the economy slows. But as this economic slowdown continues to progress, it then calls into question, it's like, well, what is the World Bank and IMF looking at to get this confidence that you're going to see this growth because we know the developed world is already slowing. You know, Europe is is is, signa- is a signature of that. Chinese data continues to disappoint on an accelerating scale. You have a slowdown in growth. You're you're negative in, or I should say, contracting on a uh, on a manufacturing basis. You know, why are we going to grow? And and, I'm, and as anybody who can attest to this, I've been saying multiple times, it's not that we get this massive collapse, but growth is going to be difficult. And that's what we continue to see based on some of these separate data points. Now, China, uh, China's copper demand indicator is is languishing. And again, it's just it's just going sideways. And it's important to look at that when you start looking at commodity prices and what the growth of China is going to look like. And as we've been saying is that it was going to bounce, but it wasn't going to explode higher, but just go sideways. And sideways based on expectations in the market is a, a write down because there was this huge expectation of this big bounce and we're just not seeing that. Now, Indonesia is set to become the largest nickel supplier for EV batteries. That's going to be an important one to watch because again, China is coming down a bit and that's an, a, a big shift when you start looking at friendliness of nation. You know, what does that supply chain look like? Because there's been an investment outside of China, trying to ensure that we have some sort of redundancy in the supply chain, because obviously the relationship between China and the US and Europe to a degree has been in, let's call it a fragile state, is I think a better way to to describe it. So then when you look at some of the disinflation, this is a net positive, because when you look at China, China's PPI is negative, which is typically more of a leading indicator for CPI, and export prices have been falling. Now, they're still coming from a very elevated level. You know, even as they fall, they're still ele- uh, at a higher point. But again, this still points to some of that benefit that will get passed through. We saw some stimulus come through um, the uh, the Chinese numbers. But remember, you know, the, if you look at the cut uh, of rates, it increases yuan, um, uh, yuan levels to 237 billion, but they let 200 billion expire. So net net, there was an injection of 37, which is still positive. But in the grand scheme of things, you get an idea that you have to look at those nets. And you're looking at inherent slowdowns, not only just based on export levels, which we'll talk about the export numbers in this in the last segment, which were very weak. But also, these price reductions are showing you, you know, less competition, less activity, 
which is going to be an underlying issue. Now, global supply chain index continued to fall in May. Six month change is deeply negative and only instance with a larger decline was in October 2020. So again, shipping is not the problem anymore. Like we're not we're not sitting here with this huge supply side driven inflation that is now gone. And, and has been completely unwound to a large degree. You know, we'll get another one when some of these contract prices come down because spot is very uh, pro- problematic as we talked about in the uh, EIA show yesterday. So again, that's a, that's a positive, but the stickiness that we continue to see in inflation, which is why I think people are still getting it wrong on the inflation side is because it supply side was a big problem. We are by no means saying it wasn't, but it wasn't the only problem. And it was, if you want to think of it from a monetary policy perspective, there was a ton of liquidity dumped into the market over the last 15 years. You know, from a, uh, a supply shortage side, that has been abated, but we have a labor shortage that has not been abated. You know, you have uh, underlying costs that continue to, to go higher on a, on a different commodity level or at least stop coming down, which again leads to that stagflation component that we've been talking about. And here's one of the big ones, and this is another place that I think the market is over, um, is giving Russia a bit too much credit. Ukraine exports through safe corridor fell to the lowest in May. And and remember, they, they technically renewed it, but one of the things that we've been talking about is they can renew it, but are they going to do the inspections? And if they renew it on paper, sign it, but then don't expect any, sh- any ships, well, nothing, nothing changed. And that's a big issue when you start looking at some of these different levels. Now take into the fact that, you know, from all accounts that we've seen, you know, Ukraine has started a, uh, to launch a counteroffensive. Now, a counteroffensive takes time. So it's not like it just happens right away and, and you need to see this play out. But if Ukraine is launching a counteroffensive, uh, why would Russia do something that would en- enable Ukraine to make money and move this through? Which is, and I think when you look at the, the, va- the volume of product moving the safe corridor, it continues to weaken. South American grain exports are set to overshadow Black Sea, uh, Black sea shipments this year as doubts grow over a UN-backed Ukraine deal, which is one thing that we continue to see. The grain deal, which allows a safe passage of grains through three Ukrainian ports, was ex- extended on May 17th for two months, shorter time frame than expected. But again, you're not seeing the inspections. So, and remember, as they as we approached May 17th, there were about 67. No, 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 I'm sorry, 17 vessels waiting for inspection. And it's not like we've seen a huge surge because that should have been accounted for moving things through. The corridor is definitely not performing as it was at the beginning. It's more focused on the smaller shi- uh, ship sizes now. I do, uh, I do think that with some quite uh, big crops in Brazil, you might also see some of the demand being switched out of the Black Sea into Brazil at some point, coming from uh, Jan, the president of Cargill's Ocean Transportation. Record production of both corn and beans in Brazil in the current 22-23 season has seen led to strong demand. So there's some buffering, but now now we start looking towards the current crops, which were uh, talked about, and we want to look at drought issues and an El Nino that is expected to only strengthen through the rest of this year. So U.S. corn production areas experiencing drought has uh, has surged higher. Uh, when, but then when you look at China, uh, torrential rains hit China's wheat growing regions just as the harvest was beginning. So about 80% of wheat area has been harvested. That's roughly on par with last year when releases of an estimate of yield and quality shortly after the wheat harvest is declared uh, complete. So we're still waiting. China is the world's largest wheat grower. And last year it was the wheat, uh, it was the biggest wheat importer as well. A clear estimate of this year's wheat harvest will clarify potential impacts. Beijing considers wheat along with rice as as critical to food security and a serious crop failure would only intensify those fears. Now, that's what we have is being put out in the news. We have heard from other sources that the rot has been accelerated because of the wheat, because not only did it impact the wheat that was still in the ground, it saturated a lot of the piles in terms of where this wheat was being kept and caused a significant amount of rot. So as you see some of these things where even though China was, uh, Brazil was better, 
you know, are we going to see some of this absorption because of not only drought issues in the, U- <coughs> excuse me, in the U.S., <coughs> but also because of issues in China. So now when you look at the U.S. drought monitor, <clears throat> you can see that some things have improved, but the areas of exceptional and severe and extreme drought are in critical growing areas for this time of year, i.e. corn and beans. So you're seeing a continuous issue, which is why the quality of the U.S. crop has continued to get written down over the last uh, few weeks. Now, the other issue is some of the uh, some of, of the um, uh, leaves have been called what's called pineappling, which is when they actually curl up. And it typically is a, is signifying that the sh- that their the crop is under stress, and they're doing things to slow down growth and to conserve, which then usually means that it yields less fruit, less of that uh, the key piece that we're growing. So again, these are going to be things to watch. It's still June fifteenth. It's not like this is written in stone, but these are some issues to look at as we start to uh, to factor in what is coming as the El Nino side. So expected impacts of El Nino on global weather, the shift from La Nina will have the a, a sizable impact, especially because it's expected to get very strong through this year and into the winter, which again is going to reduce some key areas, i.e. India. So typically you have a much weaker monsoon season, which impacts uh, growth. You know, that also is going to make things a bit worse in Africa when you look at kind of where the Sahara is. So that that band right there is where you go from the Sahara into a rainforest. And that Senegal goes straight across into that that uh, that Ethiopia side. And that band being so much drier means that the Sahara, not to say that the, the, the desert's going to expand, but there's a lot of pressure in terms of that heat. So that's a huge impact. And then when you look at South America, Brazil uh, doesn't get much reprieve while Argentina and the U.S. does. But again, these are going to be important things to watch because some areas that have already been under stress, i.e. India, is going to become much worse. And we've already seen issues in there. Now, putting it into perspective, when you look at rice uh, prices in El Nino, the cost of this uh, staple typically goes up in El Nino periods. So a weak El Nino in 1819 and large Indian crop kept prices, price increases subdued. But typically, as you start to see in El Nino, that dryness, which steals some of that moisture from these key growing areas. And the reason why we touch on, on rice is because it's such a pivotal crop for the emerging markets and especially in Asia. And as that drops down, rice being the cheapest crop or the cheapest food stuff, that's going to create more issues because then places that normally rely on rice have to try to go up the scale. And again, that creates shortages in other areas. So even if you get a big bumper crop in beans, but a big issue in rice, well, that still balances out, which is why we talk so much about global yields and global pressures. Now, just looking at the chance of El Nino events by three-month period in strength, you can see that it continues to, uh, it, it starts out as weak, and as we progress through the year, it continues to strengthen. Now, when you start looking at global land and ocean temperature anomalies, you can see that periods of where El Nino have coincided with record global temperatures, 98 and 16 being examples, and we've already seen moisture levels hit points that we haven't seen since the uh, essentially peak of Dust Bowl. Now, putting that all together and starting to look at some of the metrics, the emerging market 10-year government uh, bond spread and the U.S. 10-year yield spread, you know, has started to to kind of, uh, you know, collapse into itself. And global export value, volumes had a nice bounce on a year-over-year basis. So you've seen some, some benefit in terms of some of the percentages. But remember, as we talked about in the EIA show, June is, a, is typically a good month. And even though it's a better month than, than obviously May and some of the others, it's still much weaker than it has been in years past. So even though export volumes bounced, we do think this is more of a seasonal component. 
and we want to look at how is that how are those things being impacted going forward obviously you had china coming back after some of their slowdowns there was some makeup in that number not a huge amount but then when you start looking at some pivotal areas like china south korea taiwan all of their exports disappointed to the downside. So again, we think this is more of a bounce and a fade in terms of volumes and more seasonal. And here's some of that, you know, another kind of looking at some confirmation of, okay, is this good or bad? Well, the semiconductor and semiconductor equipment and prices in the U.S. remain strong, but sales continue to slow. So remember, this is a, a big component on the global basis. Semi-stock prices in the U.S. remain elevated as the uh, global S&P Global PMI electronic equipment new orders continues to be below 50, which remember is in contraction. So when you look at some of the semiconductor and some of the tech side, you know, you continue to see this collapse, this pressure, which again leads us to, to believe that some of those increases in global uh, global trade is more of a seasonal basis. We'll get that movement down and that pressure is going to continue with not much reprieve as we go through the remainder of the year. And again, leads back to how much growth, like is that world was the, was the World Bank right in raising uh, GDP expectations? We don't think so, but again, it's not that we're, we should go from 1.7 to negative 1.7. We just think that it's, we're going to struggle to eke out growth this year. And then we're going to see additional pressure as we go into 24. So that's what we have for you on the global side. In the next segment, we're going to kick off the U.S., some of the key pieces on the Fed, the rates, and where we see some of these things going from here.